morning, everyone. Um, so I titled my senior lecture, Medical Ethics, Issues Abroad and at Home. So my objectives for today, I want to discuss the value of international medicine for physician development. Um, international medicine is one of uh, my interests, and I think it's very important for professional and um, personal growth. I also want to discuss the various ethical challenges abroad uh, that I face while practicing medicine. And then I want to relate it to how it um, kind of correlates with some of the issues that we see here in Brooklyn. And then we'll examine how ethics influence the way that we practice medicine. So we'll just start with some basic terminology that we all learned in med school. So uh, starting with autonomy, so basically this relates to respect for persons, is the acknowledgement of the person's right to make choices, hold views, and uh, take action based on their personal values and beliefs. Um, so for a patient to be able to um, have autonomy, you want to make sure that their decision making is free of any coercion. So they, they should be explaining the risks and benefits of any procedure or medical intervention, um, and uh, they should know the likelihood of success of that intervention. Next one is justice. It's, uh, it relates to treating others equitably, distributing benefits and burdens fairly. An example of this could, uh, you know, when you could think of medical um, shortages as far as like medications. Sorry, um, you, you know, were those shortages of the medications distributed to uh, which communities get which um, medication? So. Uh, that's one example for justice. Beneficence is uh, providing benefits to your patients and contributing to their welfare. It refers to an action done only for the benefit of the patient. And uh, I, we being providers, we always have to make sure that we stay on top of our uh, you know, uh, clinical development and maintain our skills and knowledge so we um, do the best for our patients. And then non-maleficence is basically doing no harm. It's our obligation to not inflict harm intentionally to our patients. Now, I'm just going to quickly talk about my international experience. So as a med, as a med student, I spent some time in Kenya. But more recently, I went to Haiti as a third year. Um, I went to the hospital Bernard Mavs, which is in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And uh, this was actually funded by CIR, so that's a little plug. Um, but it's, it was actually the country's uh, largest trauma center, only trauma center, I believe, um, and it's heavily reliant on volunteers. But they also had some local um, hired physicians that worked there as well. So this is just, okay, this is a picture of me. So I was able to work clinically. This is me giving a lecture to the, uh, medicine interns. Uh, we were reviewing EFAS and reviewing some anatomy, so it was a great teaching opportunity for me as well. And um, it was also a good cultural experience. So I got to see the land, eat the food, meet the people, and it was great to see where a lot of our patients come from. So it's a very beautiful country. Aside from that, you know, we, I saw a lot of great clinical cases as well. So I got to see lots of trauma, you know. Um, it was also an opportunity to see interesting pathology as well. And the great thing about it is um, I acted as the attending, you know. I got to manage my own cases. Um, it was also good because they had enough support. There was uh, a number of other volunteers there that ranged from people who were entering into retirement and also new attendees there, so I never really felt alone. So it was a really good experience. Now, medicine in the developing world is very challenging. So this picture is actually of one of the sinks that was in the ER that was out of commission the entire time I was there for like two weeks. So there was actually no working um, plumbing in the ER, which was interesting. So what makes it challenging? Um, this is a topic in and of itself, really. Um, but really the lack of infrastructure is one of the major issues. So access to water and food. While I was doing some research, I found it interesting that worldwide, one in 10 people don't have access to safe water. 
And uh, you know, that number goes up when you're just looking at the developing world. And then also roads, right? How, how, if there's lack of uh, good road systems, how does your patient get to the hospital? Um, is there an ambulance system that can reach uh, people who need to get to the hospital as well? And then just overall, the demand is greater than the supply when it relates to medicine, physicians, hospitals, and clinics. So these are all um, barriers. So for this talk, I'm going to do it more case-based. And um, we're, we're going to go through some ethical dilemmas that come up in the cases that I, act, that I saw while in Haiti. And we're going to relate it to how, uh, so how some of the issues that we see here at home as well. So the first case, a uh, 20-year-old man, no past medical history. He was an unhelmeted motorcyclist struck by a truck traveling at an unknown speed. So this scenario is very common. Uh, there's a lot of motorcycle um, used uh, in Port-au-Prince and a lot of people didn't wear helmets at all. So for the interest of time, so key features of the exam, he's mildly tachycardic, his GCS is three, there's obvious head trauma. Um, on, your, on further evaluation, there's no clear chest or abdominal injuries that you see using your exam and your bedside ultrasound skills as well. So we all know what to do. This is bread and butter, EM, airway, breathing, <coughs> circulation. You know that the patient needs to be intubated. The issue is that there's four ventilators in the whole hospital and all of them are used by the ICU. So do you intubate and just uh, inevitably bag this patient? Um, this patient actually came to me at an overnight shift where it's just me, a nurse, and a translator. And it was like a, probably around 3 a.m. or so, so we had a couple more hours into our shift and with limited resources. So you expect, you suspect intrapenial hemorrhage, um, but you're also concerned about other injuries, right? If this patient rolled into Kings County, you're going to intubate and pan scan uh, for the most part. Um, but in this scenario, the patient's family is paying out of pocket. You know the prognosis is poor just based on your initial exam, so what tests do you order? You know? So the question really is how aggressive are you are in your resusc resuscitation? So I want to talk about resuscitation efforts. Uh, resuscitation is something as ER doctors, it's what we're born to do. <laughs> so these are just some points that I got from the ASEP website. Um, basically, patients who benefit from resuscitation efforts should have equal access to such efforts. So, will there ever be a time that there's no available ventilators here in Brooklyn? Probably not. Um, but there will be times where you do have limited resources um, and limited personnel. Um, so, uh, the next point is decision to attempt resuscitation must take into account the accepted standards of medical care and the safety of medical personnel. Now looking at the other spectrum where um, we start thinking about when do we start withholding resuscitation efforts, and this can relate to uh, not only trauma patients, but probably more so medical resuscitations. Um, so uh, here's basically highlighting the key points, the lack of immediately available resources, um, such in my case in Haiti, but even here, maybe you're working in a rural area, uh, once you get done from uh, residency, it's important to know what resources you have available, what services you have available um, before um, undergoing aggressive resuscitation. Um, and then also knowing uh, the realistic likelihood of benefit for the patient. Um, and then uh, my last point is that when, when you do get to the point where you decide that resuscitation efforts are, are not indicated, um, you should start thinking of medical and uh, uh, psychosocial care during the dying process. So not, so, not, well, for the patient, but also probably more so for the patient's family as well. So I want to talk about when resuscitation becomes futile. So once you cross that line where you, as a physician, you collect all the data available um, in the case and you determine that you know continuing resuscitation wouldn't be any benefit to the patient um, so once you cross that line at that point then you run the risk of wasting resources so while i was in haiti it was interesting because every single thing you use from the gauze um, you know they they marked 
they, uh, there was accountability for it because uh, the limited, the resources were so sort, uh, so scarce, sorry. Um, but here, you know, we open Central Line kits, we open LP kits, oh, oh, never mind, we don't have to use it, we throw things away, um, but that you couldn't do there. But even with wasting resources here, more so, I think it relates to um, us as a providers, right? If we're in a room with a patient for an hour, hour plus, try, trying to work on some uh, patient that we know medically that probably the likelihood of survival is, is close to none, you know, you're pulling yourself away from patients who you could be helping, right? Have you ever been in, this, in the busy CCT where you're, you're in a resuscitation, you know, maybe your attending ends up calling it and you walk out and you see a whole line of patients waiting to be cleared. You know, those, among those patients could be someone who's septic or someone who's, you know, a stroke code or what have you. So you have to think of yourself as a resource. And then risk of provider injury I put up here. Um, the procedure that came to my, my mind was like ED thoracotomy. Uh, everyone wants to get that before they graduate, but really it's a very um, accident prone procedure and you really have to take into account when is it appropriate to do. Um, then you have to think of the patient's autonomy. Um, usually for younger patients, I think we tend to be more aggressive for obvious reasons, but for older patients and medical resuscitations, if it's an elderly patient, end stage disease pathology, then you want to really take into account what would the patient want. And the family could be a, a great resource for this, or if they have a living will, that would be um, very helpful as well. And I think um, I feel concerns for litigation and criticism. Um, you know, as ER doctors, we're taught to be aggressive, to kind of go in a recitation, um, you know, uh, hitting the ground. but. I think in situations where we may hold back more, uh, there might be a cultural concern for being criticized and not being as aggressive since it's within our nature. So going back to the case. Um, so I bit the bullet. Um, I decided not to intubate the patient because um, there was concerns for, because there was limited resources. Um, I did follow the patient to CT with my airway thing in hand, um, but I wanted to get a CAT scan to see what exactly was I working with. Was this an epidural? Most likely it was more than that given um, his exam. So this is a, actually his CAT scan. His CAT scan actually looked worse, but he did have an extensive subdural with shift. He also had intraparenchymal bleed uh, extending into the ventricles as well. So thankfully there was a neurosurgeon on call, and we actually re reviewed the scans together and uh, both came to the conclusion that there was no likely benefit for this patient. So from there, um, kind of turned to more end of life discussion. So um, in this case, the physician, the neurosurgeon that was on call, he spoke English very well and he also spoke Creole as well. And so it was very helpful to have him there because he, he was able to help me relay to the family um, you know, the prognosis and uh, what were the next steps and that basically there, there wasn't much we could do. So, thought about end of life discussion. It's always a difficult uh, discussion to have with the family, um, but it, it's particularly more difficult in the ER and there's a lot of different barriers. Um, so when you think of like an ER environment, uh, a lot of times it's overcrowded, uh, chaotic environment, lots of things happening at once. Um, our, our attitudes and perceptions also influence the delivery of palliative care. Um, so knowing when to recognize that there's not much we can do medically for the patient is very important. Um, you know, if, if I were to act, if I was acting more aggressive and intubating and pan scanning and, you know, uh, doing more interventions, uh, maybe that could have given a false hope for the, for the patient's family as well. And then um, relating back here to Brooklyn more so, being aware of your hospital resources, you know, using your social worker, if it's during the day, during the week, and if you're at county, maybe getting the palliative care team as well to help you. And then understanding the relevant medical legal issues. So as long as you document well, um, the family is, is on board, even if 
really, even if they're not on board, but if you explain everything clearly, um, a lot of times you have to explain things multiple times to the patient's family, because they'll, they'll have, you know, it's, all, it's, it's a lot to swallow. So that brings me to my first break in the small discussion. So I want you guys to just, you know, get in small groups, maybe five, six people, and just talk about some of the things that you consider before ending your resuscitation. What are some of the challenges of initi initiating palliative care in the ED? And how do you deliver bad news to a patient's family? So it would just take like five minutes, maybe less, and then just talk about these points, and then we'll discuss as a whole as well.
Um, so those are pictures from overseas, but you know, we have old waiting rooms here too. Um, and a lot of, you know, the waiting room in an inner city um, large uh, hospital such as this one looks, may look a lot different from a, sub, a hospital in the suburbs. And so, you know, so I want to touch on, um, you know, uh, some, look at some of the disparities, which we're all aware of, we all work um, in uh, underserved populations. So this is just a graph, I'm not sure if it's projecting well, but it's age and sex adjusted um, for people all without health insurance. So this was a, a survey interview done um, in 2015. And so the first group is Hispanic, and you see they're approaching like the 20%, um, and which is a large disparity compared to, to black, non-Hispanic, and more so white, non-Hispanic. And then the next graph is similar. Um, age and sex adjusted for those who fail to obtain medical care due to cost at some point within the last year. Um, and again, you see the, the uh, disparities of Hispanic and non-Hispanic black compared to white. And so there's many different barriers to health care, right? So one is lack of health insurance, lack of financial resources, kind of goes hand in hand at times. Uh, people who get irregular source of care, so people who use the ER as their primary care um, source, uh, those who are kind of hop around from specialist to specialist that doesn't really have a primary care doctor to tie all that in. Uh, legal obstacles I put up there for those who may be undocumented. Structural barriers, how long does it take you to get an appointment with your primary care doctor? Uh, once you're there, how long is the wait time? You know, um, I think about our clinics at county, like dental clinic or eye clinic, it's, it's ridiculous, right? Um, lack of healthcare providers. Uh, language barriers, so we all use the Syrocom phone. We all know that a lot is lost in translation when you're talking to a patient who's not a native English speaker. And age, so this mainly relates to the elderly who may be on a fixed income, who may not be able to um, get all their, uh, pay for all their pharmaceutical, or who may have cognitive disability who can't advocate for themselves. So ways to improve the system. So. Again, this is a lecture in and of itself, but just to hit on some topics. So changing the scope of practice laws. Um, put this up here uh, really in relation to mid-level providers. Uh, maybe have them do more within their scope of practice. Utilizing coordinated care models. Um, turning to telehealth, which we spoke about a couple weeks ago with Dr. Rios. Extending physician hours, which no one really wants to do, I'm sure, I think we work enough, but that's one option. Investing in the workforce, so, uh, you know, there's a shortage of ER doctors, so it's, it's interesting, every, it seems like every year now there's like a new uh, residency program that's being developed, which is great, and reducing administrative burden <coughs> as well, spending more time with your patients. So the next small group discussion, I want you guys to discuss uh, what are some physician-patient barriers that you see in the ED, uh, and what are ways that you work around our current healthcare system, and what are some ways that you know we can improve our current healthcare system. So just take like four or five minutes, and then we'll talk about some points. I was actually curious, did the, I mean, I don't think it's that, but the woman, the sister of the doctor, did she pay for the test for the other people who came? No, but they actually paid for the ambulance to go back and get the other victims to bring them in.
Thank you.